From the heartland of America to every nation on earth, this is Jack Van Empey Presents The Truth in News and Commentary. Here now are doctors Jack and Rexella Van Empey. Welcome to Jack Van Impey Presents. I have never been asked so many questions as I have been asked this past week about a certain date. And you all know what I'm going to say. What happened on Judgment Day, May 21st, 2011? Big question. Israeli leader clashes with Obama over 1967, Israel's borders. My, that is a big one also. And Iran's Ahmadinejad in a tirade against Israel. Well, that's really no surprise, but it's a new tirade, and we will refer to it in just a moment. But you know, friends, when Jack heard uh, that uh, Mr. Camping, Harold Camping, said that the end of the world would occur on May 21st, 2011, he wanted to prove from the Bible it would not happen. And so several months before uh, it came out that what he had to say, we did a video on it. And here you see the video that we did, the DVD, Harold Camping, Into the World, May 21st, 2011. And Jack answers all the questions on that one. Static on the airwaves, Christian Radio Tycoon says the world will end May 21st. Surprising numbers believed him. Doomsayer has... High hopes. And going on, Judgment Day, May 21st, 2011. And of course, that is Family Radio once again. Group warns the end begins Saturday. And of course, we saw some billboards saying that very thing. By the way, Armageddon is Saturday. And bottoms up, Doomsday begins promptly at 6 o'clock. He even set the time. Doomsday Church, still open for business. And in time comes and goes rapture prediction fizzles, and followers did feel a bit sheepish. Let me just say that when we did that video, as I mentioned, Jack had no doubts because he used the Word of God. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody looks around and says, oh, it could be today. But, you know, Jack always uses the Bible, and I'm so very, very happy that he does. Now, Jack, I'm going to ask a big question. Why did you not believe that May 21st would be the day? Because the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And John 17.17 17 says, Thy word is truth. And 120 times God says the world will never end, as we're going to see just a little later. But, oh, we've always had these false prophets. And Jeremiah 14, 14 says, The prophets are lying prophets in my name, and I have not sent them. That's why we have mass confusion. In 1843, we had William Miller. Again, in 1945, Herbert Armstrong. And then in 1988, Edgar Wisenot. And now this man for May 21st, in the year 2011. And I said it wouldn't happen because my Bible says it won't happen. And everybody comes along with the same nonsense. Nobody knows the day and the hour, Matthew 24, 36. That's not what it says. Keep your Bible in context. Start with verse 33. We will know when it's near, but not the day and hour, verse 36. 33 to 36, and you got the true story. Furthermore, it is not talking about the rapture. 
the rapture is not in the four Gospels. Paul was given the mystery to explain the rapture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 56. Instead, Matthew 24, 36, concerning that no man knows the day or the hour, refers to Christ's return to the earth to set up his kingdom when he comes regally, royally, and majestically in Revelation 19, verse 11, on a white horse. And he comes as the king of the kings and lord of the lords to rule and reign for 1,000 years, Revelation 20, verse 4. And it's going to be a happy time, not judging and killing everybody. He comes to put a stop to those who are destroying the earth and one another. That's after Armageddon that man has created in Revelation 16, 16. Furthermore, I didn't believe the date because I believe in geography. You see, he said 6 o'clock, but there are 24 different time zones in the world. So when it's six o'clock here, there it's 23 at different times around the world. So no man can know the day and the hour, study your geography. And I knew he was really off. And I'm going to really excite you here in a minute about what the Bible really teaches. All right, Jack, a moment ago, he said the world would never end. In other words, when Jesus comes back and he said he was going to come back to the earth, the King of kings and Lord of lords for 1,000 years to reign with peace on the earth. When the Lord comes back, it doesn't mean the end of the world. Will the end of the world ever happen? There are six texts mistranslated in this holy book. And they are Matthew 13, 39, verse 40, verse 49, Matthew 24, 3, Matthew 28, 20, and Hebrews 9, 26. And instead of saying the end of the world, they should say the end of the age of grace. There are seven dispensations, and the fifth and sixth have to do with Moses and Christ. And the Bible says that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And that's Matthew 1.17. But there are two dispensations, two ages there. The fifth and the sixth and the seventh age will be when Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom on earth. Now watch this. Matthew 24.3. The disciples came to Jesus and said, What shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? No, no, end of the age of grace. Why? Just turn the page. Matthew 25.31. The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with all his holy angels. And then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory as he rules the world. And when he comes, he says to those who are ready, come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 34, you get it? They talk about the end of the world in chapter 24, verse 3. But it can't happen because in chapter 25, verse 31, he comes to earth to set up his kingdom. So it hasn't ended. The world's still intact. So change the word world to age in those six instances and you'll have a correct interpretation of God's holy word. So Jack, the coming of the Lord is not a doomsday event. It's not going to be a doomsday message at all. It's a, a wonderful time when the Lord comes back, no. right? All right, let me prove now the world will never end. Ecclesiastes 1, 4, the earth abides forever. Now, that doesn't take a genius to interpret it. Forever is forever. Psalm 104, verse 5, Yahweh God created the earth and it shall never, never be removed. How long is never? Never. <laughs> the meek shall inherit the earth, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 5. Not heaven, we go there when we die, but we come back with him to live here on earth. We're going to be here forever and forever, soon after Christ returns with his people in heaven. Now, how long do the meek inherit the earth? Psalm 37, 29. The meek and the righteous inherit the earth forever and forever. Heaven's going to be changed to terra firma. We'll be on this old globe. And isn't it strange that he picked our particular planet for that in the future? But Isaiah 45, 17 and Ephesians 3, 21 both say it's a world without end. That's easy to understand, isn't it? Every Catholic Mass ends with that. For 2,000 years, world without end. Amen and amen. Now, why? And I've just given you six. I got another 114 to go. Believe me, the world will not end. But let's continue. It can't end because he's going to reign here. First of all, for that 1,000 years, Revelation 20, verse 4. 
Then, at the end of that period, he is recommissioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28. Why? To continue his reign on this globe forever and forever and forever. Now, listen carefully. Revelation 11, 15. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of this Christ and his God. Now, kingdoms don't have to do with heavens. Kingdoms have to do with earth, and that's why Jesus comes and controls the kings and kingdoms of the earth, because he's the king of the kings, Revelation 19, verse 16. You and I reign with Christ for a thousand years in Revelation 20, verse 4, but in Revelation 22, 5, after he's recommissioned, we reign with him forever and forever here on the earth. It's forever that this kingdom's going to last. Oh, I love it when... The angel Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary on that glorious morning when Christ was born, and he said in Luke 1, verses 32 and 33, Oh, Mary, your son shall be the greatest, and he shall sit upon the throne of his father David in Jerusalem, and he shall reign over the house of Israel forever and forever, and of his kingdom there'll be no end. Now, that's not only Christianity, but that is Judaism when their Messiah comes. And Daniel 2.44 says, In the days of these kings, what kings? The revived Roman Empire in that chapter. The European Union, which we've lived to see. What about it? In the days of these kings shall the Lord God of heaven set up his kingdom here on earth, which shall never be destroyed. Never. It shall stand forever. <laughs> How long is forever? It's forever. And oh, do I love Daniel 7.18, Rexella. The saints of the Most High God shall take and possess the kingdom and possess it forever, even forever and ever. He, God Almighty mentions this three different times. The world will never end. Now, I've got hundreds of more verses to back that up. Forget the six misinterpreted ones and all you guys have been predicting the end of the world and there have been many over the years. Forget it and sleep well. When Jesus comes, it's not going to be doom and gloom. Oh, I love that, Jack. I love that, don't you? Well, you know, friends, something is happening right now that really burdens my heart. We're seeing Israel and the Jewish people being put on the spot by our president. Okay. What does he want them to do? He wants them to give up Jerusalem and go back to pre-1967 borderline. And uh, let's take a look. Let's go back a little bit farther and take a look at Jewish history. All right, here you see it. Let's go back when the world descended into madness. Now you see the front gate of Auschwitz, the infamous Nazi extermination camp in Poland. It just burdens my heart, and I've often wondered why. Why have the Jewish people been so hated, even wanted to be exterminated when Nazi Hitler was in control? Jack, why? Rexella, it's always been that way. Let's go back 2,534 years in history. It's 586 B.C., and Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 1.1, marches down to Jerusalem and takes all of the Jews out of their land. It's not the Palestinians. It was theirs. And he took them to his nation and kept them as slaves. Over the years, some of them returned. Then in 70 AD, Vespasian and his son Titus, the Roman general, slaughtered one million Jews and took the rest out of the country. And they've been out of their land all those years, their land, until 1948. Then we had the Dark Ages, 1,000 years. So now we go from 70 AD and we're at the year 12. 74, and Canute, king of England, drove all the Jews out of the nation. In 1306, French farmers with pitchforks drove them out of their country. In 1348, they were driven, at that time, out of uh, original Germany. In 1350, Prague. 1492, the Jews were taken out to sea out from Spain and held under the water as they cried out, God wills it. God wills it. Oh, these people have been hated. And then the maniac Adolf Schickelgruber, Hitler, came to power and murdered six million of God's people. And these statistics can be proven regardless of what the anti-Semites and the haters of the Jews say. And I could prove it if I had time, but let's go on right now. 
we have another maniac called Ahmadinejad, and his Messiah is to come. He says within 24 months before his Messiah, this great Messiah of love, who says, you must first kill all the Jews before I can come. God forgive. Them. Now why? Because 1 Chronicles 21 1 says, Satan stood against the Jews. Simple enough? Why? God loved them. He says, they're my chosen people. Deuteronomy 7, 7. He says, I chose Israel to be my wife. Hosea 2, 19. They're my elect. Isaiah 42, 1, 45, 4, and 65, verses 9 and 22. And he says, they're the apple of my eye, Zechariah 2, 8. And I'm going to tell you something. You touch these people, you're going to pay for it. I'll bless them. Them that bless you, Israel, and they'll curse them that curse you. And you watch what will happen in the future. We just had our row with Netanyahu as he came to America. And we have articles that prove that our president is an anti-Semite. He hates the Jews. And he's done everything to turn it over to the Muslims, the Palestinian Muslims, Hamas, and the rest of that crowd. And I'm going to tell you, it's not going to go very far. People are getting disturbed in America. And boy, was I happy at what just happened when Netanyahu spoke to the Congress, the Democrats in strength, including Nancy Pelosi and Reid. Both Democratic leaders always stood with our president and said, this is where we take our stand. We vote for Israel. They do not have to go back to the 67 borders. They do not have to give up Jerusalem. And there were 20 standing ovations. Whoa. I feel sorry for you, Mr. President. Thank God for this Congress. I'll bless them which bless you, Israel. Oh, yes. I'm going to back up everything you just said with headlines, the first one being from the Wall Street Journal, an anti-Israel president. The president's peace proposal is a formula for war. Former U.S. peace broker Netanyahu and Obama are on different planets. Amen. Again, Israeli leader clashes with Obama. And the Congress applauds Israelis hard line. Now that's what Jack was talking about, how they clap for Netanyahu as he spoke to them on the Mideast peace agenda. Even the Democrats applauded him. And the 1967 line of fire, Obama creates a needless furor over Israel's borders. Here you are. President Obama has thrown Israel under the bus. That's from Mitt Romney, a former Massachusetts governor. And he has rewarded the party who is the least cooperative and undermined a trust with Israel and hurt the prospects for peace. Josh Block. Now, let me go on here again. Jewish donors. Ha ha. Warn Obama on Israel. They say we helped you get in, but don't look for us next time. And Israeli leader sees rising Arab threat. Once again, Palestinians prepare to mourn Israel's creation. They're going to say, we're going to destroy you and cry over you when you're done. And uh, Hania on Nakba Day. And of course, that is a holy day for the Palestinians. And they say, pray for an end to Israel. Hamas MP, Jews in gathered for us to annihilate them. They're all there, so let's get rid of all of them. And Netanyahu, world must stop those wishing to destroy the Jewish people. And I agree why they want to kill all the Jews, I'll never know. But whose land is Israel? Is it the Jewish land or the Palestinian land? How about that one, Jack? I told you a few minutes ago that Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. took the Jews out of their own land. And then the Palestinians later took over. And in 70 A.D., Vespasian and Titus' his son, Roman generals, took them again out of the land after slaughtering one million. You need to hear that. And so for 2,534 years, they were without their own land. But then God brought them back. And listen to this, Ezekiel 36, 24, God speaking, I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of the countries of the world into your own land. Plain enough? I will put you in your own land. Ezekiel 37, 14. Amos 
9.15, I will plant them in their own land and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land. And how long is that going to last? I will give Israel an everlasting name, Isaiah 56.5. Everlasting means that God's going to keep loving them forever. Oh, yes, Jack. It's so important that we do have a love for the land of Israel and all those who are there. So pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, our time is gone. I'm sorry we don't have time to get into those seven signs. Of, oh, Jack spoke about them so often before. But I want to ask him a very important question here. What will happen next. What's on God's agenda next, Jeff? I believe Henry Kissinger, when he said, we're preparing Obama to take over the New World Order. That is the European Union, revived Roman Empire. And you know how that one comes to power? I believe he is that world dictator I mentioned on one of my videos. Listen to me. He comes in peaceably, Daniel 11, 21. Enters in peaceably, Daniel 11, 24. He makes a seven-year contract, Daniel 9, 27. But it's the contract of death and hell, Isaiah 28, 15. Why? Because by peace he destroys many, Daniel 8, 25. How can he do that? Because everyone's going to say, oh, this leader, he's brought peace, peace. There'll be no more war. It's wonderful. And that's what they're crying out in Jeremiah 6, 14, Jeremiah 8, 11. But when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. World War III, Russia makes the move, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And then China, Revelation 16, 12, and it's described in chapter 9, verse 14, 18. And finally, all nations, because what this leader of the world order has done is create war by the way he's handled the situation, just like you heard in one of the headlights. And the war begins because they divide Jerusalem, Joel 3, verse 2. Jack, I'm going to go to a very, very personal invitation right now. What does all this mean to you? Some of you have a real alcohol problem, a drug problem, problem with your children. You want peace now. There's only one way to have peace now, and that's to open your heart to the Lord, the Savior of the world. Will you do that? Allow him to come into your life. No matter what happens, you'll be ready. Right, Jack? Oh, let's call my heart. Look at me. God has made it so simple for you. He died to shed his blood to wash away every one of your sins. I don't care what you've done. It's horrible in your own eyes. But the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. Pray this then, Lord Jesus, eternal Savior, only Savior, I believe in your shed blood to wash me. I've sinned a lot, Lord, but your blood is sufficient to wash me. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart today I pray in your holy name. Amen. Oh, amen. I trust you prayed that prayer. If you did, there's my address. Please write to me. Let me know. First steps in a new direction will be in the mail. A new direction. The Lord will walk with you in that wonderful new direction. He is your Savior. He'll bring peace to you and everlasting life with Him one day. Oh, you'll be prepared for anything that might come in this world. Write to me. First steps. New Direction. Our Offer of the Week, Showdown with Iran, talking about everything in here that we've been explaining and elaborating on it. And here's our announcer to tell you how you can receive it. Bob? To order your copy of the Showdown with Iran book with a bonus DVD, The Mideast Crisis, Can Israel Survive?, have your credit card ready and call toll-free 24 hours a day, 1-800-JVI-7777. To order by mail in the U.S., send your donation of $24.95 to Jack Van Impey Ministries, Box 7004, Troy, Michigan, 48007. In Canada, send your donation of $24.95 to Jack Van Impey Ministries of Canada, Box 1717, Postal Station A, Windsor, Ontario, N9A6Y1. Oh, thank you, Bob. I do want you to have this in your home. It's so very important because, you know, the threat of war with Iran is growing every single day, and you need to know all the details. It's very, very thorough. You need to have this book. And I got a bonus for you. We're going to be talking about Israel also, as well as uh, the Mideast crisis. Oh, please, make the call or write to us, Showdown with Iran, and my bonus can Israel survive? 
You know, friends, I just want to say I love living in the United States of America. I've been in 50 countries, and none of them can compare with our wonderful country. And we need to think often about those who gave their lives for us around uh, the nation, trying to keep us free, how wonderful it is that they were willing to join the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines. God bless them all. Let's keep them all in our prayers, even today, that we may maintain our freedom of religion and speech and so forth. Wow, wonderful to have the country we have. Thank you, God for our great country. You know, my brother was in the Air Force, and I thank God for that. He was willing to join the uh, Air Force to keep our country free. You know, Jack, we need to pray for our boys and our girls around the world, don't we, and right for now? for all those who are injured and have to have artificial limbs, God bless you, boys. We love you. Oh, yes, we do love them, and we love the girls who've given a limb also. And by the way, we love the families. Let's not only keep our soldiers in our prayers, but also keep the families in our prayers also. I'd love to embrace all of you, but I can do something. I can pray for you. We may not be able to put a wreath on all of the graves, but we can pray for all those families. God bless you. I'd like to leave you with this thought. A very, very good thought. Our greatest weakness may be our failure to ask for God's strength. If ever we needed the strength of the Lord, we need it today. And that's why all the families are in our prayers. They need God's strength. Not just encouragement here and there, but they need God's strength. Look forward to being your home again next week. And until then, remember, God cares for you, so do we so very much. Bye-bye.